Welcome everyone, this is Tim Pullman and you're listening to the SEP Couch. This podcast is all about standard essential patents. We talk about patent strategies, friend licensing, patent pooling and patent litigation. So let's dive into today's episode. She is an IP strategist, a patent attorney. She has experience with global licensing and transaction and even litigation and patent policy. I'm super happy to have here today on my SEB couch, Tarane Megami. Hello, Tarane. Thanks for joining this. Hi, Tim. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure. And like in any episode, I always start to get to know a little bit more about you as a person and your career and your um, you know, your way and what leads you to become an expert on SCPs and FRAND. And it would be great if you could walk us through some of the most important steps in your career um, to get to know you better. Um, sure. Thanks. Thanks for asking. Um, yeah, like, like many lawyers that end up doing what they do without actually planning to get there when they first get out of law school, this was not exactly my, the path that I had chosen. You know, you know, that I chose, but I kind of got thrown into it. And it's been a, certainly an adventure and a great experience and a lot of fun. Um, and uh, met quite a few um, people and friends along the way. But I, I basically just started my career as a litigator. And I was in litigation with major law firms for about 10 years at the outset of my career. And then I was hired to go in-house to Compact Computers to manage their IP litigation, because during my litigation days, I had veered towards IP because I had an electrical engineering background. And we're talking, I'm aging myself now, we're talking about 1990s. And at that time, we didn't have all of this specialized patent litigation uh, presence in these law firms. So if you had a technical background and you knew litigation, basically they'd ask you to do patent litigation. And not very many patent attorneys were litigators at the time. So I wasn't a patent attorney at the time, even though I had a technical background, but I started doing patent litigation. And then when I, and then one of the firms, the last firm I was at said, well, you know, do you want to take the patent bar? I said, okay, but I never really wanted to prosecute. So, um, so I did take the patent bar. I am a patent attorney. I've got everything with patents that you can imagine other than actually appearing before the USPTO and prosecuting a patent. That's something I haven't done, but um, but then I went in house to Compact, managed their IP litigation, got bought out by HP, went to HP, switched to transactional, was there for a while doing various things that related to IP and transactional work, and then um, went to Tessera Technologies of all places, which was a totally different experience because they were a licensing company. They had developed the uh, semiconductor packaging technology that was widely successful, wildly successful, I should say. And they had started do, turning, they turned their business into a licensing business because their product was being used by everybody. And then we were building another part of the business through acquisition. So I was supporting that activity. And then lo and behold, I got thrown into this whole policy and lobbying work because of the patent reform movement that was going on at the time. We're talking about 2005 to 2010 timeframe. And so I co-founded the Innovation Alliance with companies like Qualcomm and Dolby and InterDigital and various other ones. And we started you know, going to the Hill and explaining the, the position of patent holders and why the patent reform that was being proposed at that time was not good for, for industry or for consumers and all of that. And um, it was quite successful. We, we were able to get our points across and um, being innovative companies, it really helped delivering that message because all the Hill was hearing pretty much was from uh, the megatech companies and pharmaceuticals and then companies like in, uh, intellectual ventures. And you know, so, so for us to come in as uh, technology companies that had developed very successful technologies and now had a, a very strong licensing business, it was very helpful. So I did that for a while. And then um, I left Tessera and I ended up joining Apple. So that was kind of a shift there, but that's where I started getting really experienced in the SEP area because um, I, was, uh, I was hired to do strategic licensing deals for Apple. And of course, strategic meant kind of the big ticket deals, the ones with various companies that had huge SEP portfolios. And at the time, Apple had not yet even released its LTE products. So LTE was a big deal. 
they already had an iPhone on the market, obviously. So they had some licenses, but then they had to renew and get new licenses. So I worked on that for about six years in, uh, and then also supported the standards activity um, at Apple and then left Apple in 2017 to join via licensing, which was a purely SEP related work. So this is kind of the flow of my career, just starting as a litigator and ending up with this SEP expertise. And in the process, while I'm at VIA managing all of their wireless programs, I'm, I was out there talking to all the different segments of industry and regulators that are interested in these issues and ended up somehow on the expert group that the European Commission put together for valuation and licensing of SEPs. So, um, you know, to this day, I continue to work with the European Commission because of course they continue to work on these, on these issues. And uh, so I did that, um, you know, we, we launched the uh, LT, we had the LTE pool at VIA, we took over the WCDMA pool, we launched a multi-generational pool for mobile devices. Um, and we um, also uh, started looking into automotive programs and um, so various things that was in the process of being developed or had been launched. Um, and then VIA decided that it was gonna basically get out of the wireless business and focus on its roots, which is an audio. Being a subsidiary of Dolby, they started out with an audio program. Their AAC program is one of the most successful patent pools ever launched. And now they're focusing back on audio. So I ended up leaving Tesra, or I'm sorry, leaving VIA and started my own practice. So now I'm working, get, going back to not just being a SEP lawyer, but um, working on SEP licensing, working on policy issues, and also supporting um, clients in other uh, technology areas and just doing general licensing and other type of legal work as well. So that's kind of the, the trajectory. <laughs> Oh, great. I think you have seen a lot, which is always great, especially now if you have your own company set up, you know, I think in our space, there's still uh, some education needed. And especially with new industries coming up now that will be subject to licensing that maybe have never done this before, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I get calls from people in those industries. It's interesting that I've actually now been, um, you know, talking to folks in industries that I really did not have much contact with. I mean, I, I had contact, obviously, mobile devices and things related to mobile devices with automotive. But now with all of the discussion about how is SEP licensing going to affect IoT, um, a lot of companies and IoT verticals are um, concerned, not because they feel like it's, it's going to be terrible, but just they don't know. Like you said, it, it requires education, right? And so the, because the European Commission has also made it very clear that they want to address these issues to make it easier for these new industry segments that are going to be using standard essential um, technologies, but using standards, I should say, and therefore needing standard essential patent licenses for them to kind of maneuver this space and avoid the, the kind of wars that we've had. And we continue to see out there when major companies um, breakdown, the negotiations break down between major companies for various reasons, and then they end up in litigation. And, uh, you know, that's just not something that many of these other segments and industries can, uh, can afford to do. Right. Exciting times ahead. I mean, we also see that with our client base, it's very different industries we never have been dealing with before. Um, and, you know, it always starts with explaining what this is all about so i think that's also a little bit why we started this podcast you know to get something some more information out there to the people where all this complexity is quite new to and that is also what i would love to hear from you a little bit if you think about the past 20 years and you have you know all your experience with all these different companies is there anything that you would think that has changed dramatically in the past 20 years or what is simply the same, just different? Kind of like what, what is your resume of, of that licensing, SAPs, and transaction business? Yeah. So what I have uh, seen, and I think what's contributed to where we are now, is there's been quite a shift in business models over time. Um, if you look, for example, at the cellular space, the companies that have um, very large portfolios or valuable portfolios, um, if you go way, way back, they were actually selling phones as well. 
So they were developing this technology and they were using it in products and they still use it in their products, for example, infrastructure equipment, but they're out of the phone business. And the phone business is where you have the volumes, right? At the same time, when you have companies that are now at the very top of the heap, right? That are selling the hundreds of mil hundreds of millions <clears throat> of units of phones. Um, they were not initially in this process of developing these standards. So there's been a shift because these other companies have come in and become very successful as product companies in this space. And the companies that had developed these standards, they were not, they, their, their product business died away for various reasons, and, but they had this valuable portfolio. So the portfolio became a means of monetization. Whereas before it was enough to keep peace among these companies because they had portfolios and they had products. So they were not out there attacking each other, demanding high royalty rates because the same would come back to them. So then we started seeing this, this separation between what people now call subholders versus implementers, right? And so the more the separation grows, the harder it becomes to get these deals done because the subholders want to maximize royalty from their from their portfolio. And then of course the product companies have to consider the cost of their products. They can't just keep up with the increasing demands. Every time a new version of a standard comes out, oh, you gotta pay me more, you gotta pay me more, you gotta pay me more, right? So, and then there's such a, such a wide variety of pricing in this space, particularly mobile devices, when you're talking about products, low-end product products versus high-end products, this whole issue of, well, should the royalty be based on the price is, it has been one of the first issues that was dealt with, which is not as much an issue now the way we see it, because I think everyone focuses more on the aggregate royalty for a technology, for a standard, more so than I'm getting you know, the, the, the total should be 7%, seven and a half percent of your total price. I mean, that's ridiculous. If you have a phone that's selling a thousand dollars, do you pay seven and a half percent? Then there's this cap on the price of the phone. There's so many different ways of approaching this. There's the bottom down approach, the top down approach. But the whole point here is that the ultimate result has to be something that industry is able to live with as a whole. And when you have such a wide separation, you end up getting these huge lawsuits fighting over, I mean, honestly, nothing but rates and how much needs to be paid. So that's the biggest shift I've seen. And as part of this monetization shift, we saw the rise of the uh, privateering efforts, where these companies starting selling, started selling off parts of their portfolios to entities that had no business other than to go out and enforce and make money off of them. Most of them were law firms, right? Um, or set up by law firms. And so then we saw the rise of NPEs. So this has all very much affected the way licensing was done way back when these standards like 3G and 4G were first developed and where we are now. So that's one, I mean, there's lots of other things that probably I could comment on, but that is probably the, the biggest shift that I would say I've seen. And exactly touching up on this problem, topic of litigation. And I think many people who read up on SAPs and FRAND, what you get is a lot of headlines on who's litigating whom and, you know, all these big fights. But then when we talk about, when we talk to experts in the industry or our clients, you know, we see a lot of business happening without litigation, obviously. And you are, you know, you have seen both. Um, but in particular, I think in the past years, you have been part of a lot of deals, closing deals and making any actually transaction happen. So could you elaborate a little bit on the, you know, on, on, on the tip of the iceberg, what is out there in the media and what are licensing realities? You know, uh, how do you close a deal? Are, are they, do they even care about case law in, in closing a licensing deal or is it really business? What is your experience there? Well, I mean, ultimately it all comes down to business, right, Tim? Uh, at the end of the day, everyone is looking out for their own interest and their own kind of bottom line to some extent. So when you see these high profile litigations, you look at the companies that are involved, these are big ticket items, right? Um, there's a company that wants to collect a very large sum of royalties. And there's a company that would have to pay that if they were to you know, <laughs> agree to do it, right? So, so they have different approaches to what is a fair set of terms under which they should license. And what's interesting is you look at the companies that get into these big litigations, 
and they've actually done deals before, right? So it's not as if they, I don't think anyone thinks they're going to put each other out of business or one is going to fold and pay the other exactly what they were demanding. At the end of the day, it does come down to a business deal, a business um, decision, um, and also having been in-house. I know it involves the the management. It's not just the, the lawyers and the litigators and the in-house counsel that are dealing with this. At the end of the day, the total package needs to make sense for both, which is why the main thing here is to have a balance. And we still haven't achieved that balance in the existing um, uh, fields where this is happening. And I think the hope is that we will be able to maybe achieve a better balance as we go into the licensing area in these new um, industry segments, right? So I think when you look at the headlines, you need to be smart and you say, okay, who's involved? What has been their history? What is their current position? And why are they doing this? And the fact that they can afford to do it tells you a lot, right? There's a lot at stake. Now, I suspect that a lot of these big enforcers are not going to spend as much time and effort and money pursuing every one of these other segments because they're sm much smaller players. How much, how much effort are you going to be able to put into that? How much money are you going to put into litigation to pursue a company that sells 5 million units a year, right? Versus 200 million units a year, right? So, so these are all the dynamics that, that we need to think about. And that's why you see, for example, the pool activity in some of these spaces, because these companies probably are not going to spend as much internal resources pursuing some of these licensing efforts. I've had a couple mention that to me, actually. But, um, but there's still a concern because there is going to be an effort to license and the licensing has to be on reasonable terms and it can't follow the same model that has been applied over and over again in the mobile device business. These are just different businesses. So we have seen, or you talked about a shift in the SEP holder space where, you know, now companies are more concentrating off commercializing their technology and even selling off to, you know, NPEs and, and, and other, you know, forms of licensing. But what we foresee probably for the next generation, 5G and beyond, in IoT is even a bigger shift, I feel sometimes, that the licensee side is going to kind of change. And, and you touched upon, on this one already in the beginning. But, um, you know, the use cases are so different and the industries are so different. Uh, and I, you know, also had conversations with these companies they often don't even have a licensing department. They have a mm -hmm. small prosecution typically focused department of four or five people that do nothing but filing patents. Um, yeah. You know, how, how will this even work? I mean, even if this company has a few million uh, euros business, it's not a startup yet, but even those small, medium-sized entities, they, they are not set up for entering no negotiations on, on FRAND or SEPs or anything. What, what, what do you foresee um how will this work is, is is a patent pool the only solution is there anything else that can be done um well no i, I mean patent pooling uh, is from the licensor side right so so you create a patent pool it doesn't mean the patent pool is going to offer any more reasonable rates than you would if you were doing bilateral it's just that you put your patents and many of the companies that get into patent pools do not actually have much of a bilateral licensing program anyways so there's, there's a concept of valuation. Is the patent pool giving you any better value than you would if, get if you were to deal with some of these companies bilaterally? There are definitely benefits of pooling, but it has to be done right. It has to consider the, a balance. It has to be balanced, right? So if there's yeah. a pool that's simply pushing for the licensor point of view and the licensor demands, then how is that different? than any licensor negotiating, right? So it has to, and that's one of the things I liked about the pools we had as VIA, because we had a lot of implementers in our, in our programs as well, right? So we had Google in our program, we had Lenovo in our program, we had the network operators in our program. So we did have more of a balance in terms of what is the viewpoint of the implementers and what's the viewpoint of licensors. We also had you know, companies that were heavy licensors. So, so I think that balance is a key issue here. And if there is, uh, you know, the goal here is to increase transparency. So these new companies who don't have the resources, as you said, maybe they hire outside experts like me, maybe they hire outside counsel. 
um, you know, law firms that have dealt with this before, whatever, or they maybe hire someone for in-house to just focus. I know one company that recently hired someone just to focus on these step issues. They, if there's enough transparency, so they know, okay, I have to deal with these companies. This is kind of the range of aggregate rate that I need to consider because this is what is acceptable to industry as a whole. That's something that's going to take time to develop because if the licensors come out and say, you pay me the same amount that the mobile device manufacturer, I'm asking for mobile device manufacturers, they're like, I, I, I can't, right? It's just not the same use of the technology. So the technology has to have some kind of value in and of itself. This has been a big part of the fight, right? Valuation should be based on the price of the product or the way that technology is being used for the most part, right? Now you can say, is all of that standard being used? Is only a small part of it being used? All those things are fair questions. But this concept of because you are using, for example, LTE or any other, take audio, take video, whatever you want to take, HEVC, because you're using this, you have to pay me a certain amount that's based on your product, right? Because so much more goes into these products. So much more resources and development effort goes into the products by the product manufacturer. The standard is the standard. It's developed. It has a value. That's the value that needs to be, um, you know, uh, thought about when you when any of these companies say, okay, I want to use the standard. What's it going to cost me? And when you have these long lead times, for example, in certain industries, let's say medical devices, and they need to know now what is the cost of building the standard into their product, right? They need to know because if they go through all of their approval process and all of the things they need to do, and at the end of the day, people come holding their hands and saying, you got to pay me a ton of money. It's just, it's just not going to happen. And there's a lot more concern now that this is going to affect public interest, maybe in a, in a greater way than we've ever seen before because of the nature of the products we're talking about. So I think the companies need to have better transparency and there needs to be a concern and a way to get better balance and efficiency is huge. These litigations are not affordable, right? So you need to have a way of getting to that end result faster. And you need to have a mindset of, we need to work together to get there. We can't just be looking out for ourselves. We have to see the other side's point of view as well. So that's, that's generally the way I think about it. And if you think about also the, the different target markets here, I mean, I, I feel that in IoT, the licensees are they're, they're a lot more and they're a lot smaller. So it needs to be even more simple for them to just sign up somewhere and don't worry about things. I mean, at least if I think if I would be, you know, a, a legal um, advisor of one of those companies, I would want a where can I sign that I have no problems in the future? Well, I'm not going to negotiate any price. It has to be somehow reasonable that they're not going out of business and they make sure that all the competitors sign too, right? I mean, those are the, the right. things right. that create complexity in a market. But wouldn't a pool also, I mean, as you say, a pool kind of just represents the opinions of the patent holders anyways. But what I would think that also a pool must be successful in a way that implementers want to use the technology because I think in IoT we have other options, right? It's not like a phone, you know, without mm -hmm. LTE, your phone, you cannot sell it, right? But maybe that one sensor or that one IoT device could also work with Bluetooth similar in a similar way. I mean, maybe LTE would be a bit better, but is is it worth that value add, right? Right, but right. I mean, there's, yeah, I've, I've heard one company a few years ago at a conference, one company say, you know, if, if Wi-Fi works okay for me, why would I want to go pay more for cellular? You know, it just depends what value I'm getting out of it. So that's why I said the patent holders need to consider what would happen if industry and implementers decided not to, to use those standards too. So they can't be overly aggressive and say, you have to use it, therefore you have to pay me this amount because then we get into these situations we are now. Um, at the end of the day, the, the right result has to be achieved among the, the parties. Now, you mentioned about the small size of some of these um, new entrants or verticals and all that. One of the concepts that's being talked about, and that was also part of the expert report that we put out um, with the European Commission under that, you know, under, from the expert group that we had, is this concept of uh, 
pooling of licensees, what, what they called, I think, LNGs, I, I, if I remember correctly, licensee negotiation groups. And the concept there is to, um, you know, taking into account the potential for um, kind of collusion and, you know, antitrust and anti-competitive issues, dealing with all of that in a way that allows these licensees to actually band together under some umbrella and that doesn't need to be, I mean, right now there's nothing created. So I can't say it's going to be, you know, a, an organization blessed by the DOJ and we have a business review letter, how it's going to work like pools do. It's not that, but at least be able to negotiate jointly so that if there is an organization that represents them or a person that represents them and says, okay, we are going to, we, and goes to licensors and says, we, um, want a license for, let's say, all these companies together at the same price or a certain number of units, you know, and then is able to, and those uh, licensees are able to take advantage of that broader umbrella license. Those are all things that have been talked about. Now, you can imagine licensors may not like that because that gives them, you know, less negotiation power because they're not dealing with, you know, they're not able to push each and every licensee the way they want they would be dealing probably with a much more sophisticated negotiator and they'd be talking, but they would get higher volumes. You know, they're, mm. again, it's a balance. It's a trade-off, right? Get your rates to a reasonable amount. You get the higher volumes, you make your money and you don't spend money on litigation. You know, that's, that's what's missing here is this balance that we need to get to and not knowing who owns what, because the, that's, I mean, this is what you do, right? You go with the, declaration system and you know there's no declarations for wi-fi there's no declarations for audio or video and you have etsy you know and those are not giving us the right answers right it's a starting point it's a great starting point to have but you need more and you need to be able to see okay who owns what what is the total amount that i would potentially have to pay for if i paid everyone which is called the aggregate rate based on the whole stack and then um how is it going to be divided up? The problem is the licensors don't agree with each other in terms of who owns what anyways. Like, so those are all things that are not going to be able to have complete answers, but the negotiations need to take all of those issues into account. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm always taking the economist view on this. And to me, it's, you know, it sounds simple now, but it's, it's a supply and demand curve. And when they meet, that's the right price. So mm -hmm. especially for IoT, you know, you have to go down with the price, but it will in the end give you more revenue because, you know, you have a, a larger demand. And I think, I mean, um, you know, I cannot comment on, you know, the anti-trust um, uh, issues with LNGs, but, you know, also transaction cost wise, it makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, it aggregates yeah. to negotiating parties, even if you have a pool on the other side and then an LNG yeah. on the other, you may have one agreement. You know, we've seen that in the past even. Um, I think one one example was RPX and Sisville. They had one deal closed, which somehow solved, you know, interests of both sides in just one agreement. I think that's that's something at least worth thinking about, given that all the legal parts are figured out, as you said. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Um, so, so I think that one, one thing that, um, you know, one way to deal with this issue with people have not been willing to do is if you actually go to the component level, you may solve some of these issues, right? I mean, we've had the, the age old discussion about the SSPPU model. You know, there are some that believe that model is fine. You know, why not have that model? We had it as part of the IEEE policy. What that does is basically gives you the basis of the royalty base as something that actually incorporates that technology. And therefore, since that technology is in that component, that should be the basis. And that component is then distributed to many licensees, right? Or many potential licenses, many end users, I should say, right? So if you license at that level, even if it's a lower rate, you capture a much larger segment of the market and you're capturing the standard or the technology at the core of where it exists, right? Now, there's been a lot of battle on this issue among uh, you know, major companies out there. It is not one that is universally accepted as a way to approach it. But now when we get into the IoT business, we have even more, this is the level of licensing issue, right? We have even more component levels that need, can be looked at. I mean, you can go all the way down to the chip level, which was the issue when you were talking with SSPPU about mobile devices, they were like, chip level is just not gonna work, right? Whatever. 
But now we have an automotive. We've seen the fight over, you know, you've got the chips, you've got the modules, then you have even another level above that, right? You have TCUs, you have various component levels. And because of the licensing model in the automotive business, there has been there was there's a lot of friction because automotive companies don't typically go out and take these IP licenses. But then you have licensors coming to you saying, I am only going to license to you. I'm not going to license to your supplier. But that's not the way the model works, right? And I'm sure all the other IoT uh, verticals have their own way of, of doing right. business with the suppliers. But isn't it easier to license at that component level, at the module level, at the you know other levels where you have, for example, there was a deal done, this is MBIOT, of course, but there was a deal done between Huawei and Nordic Semiconductor, right? So it's doable. It just depends what you're demanding and how greedy you're being in terms of the, the amount of money that you want to get. And of course, you can get some more from a higher price end product like a car. Um, and some say, well, it's a matter of tracking. It's a matter, a matter of it's easier to license at this level. There's arguments on both sides. I mean, I, I've lived on many sides of this issue, as you know, but the point is what creates this balance that we're seeking? And then people have to get out of their their kind of, you know, the current mindset they have that the, with the blinders they have on and look around and see what is the best way to be able to create a better landscape here. Right. And I mean, especially as at least some IoT markets are exactly structured that way, right? They have big mm -hmm. component manufacturers that produce you know hundreds of millions of, of of components and then you have all these small end users right i mean it's right. impossible to to kind of chase these for money right and thinking about all these transaction costs maybe taking that from the license price you may come at an equilibrium that is even more more efficient while right. i mean you know keeping those arguments up in some other industries that has worked on the OEM level for sure, but you know, it doesn't mean that it that we have to rethink it in other industries, maybe. Right, right, exactly. And there was such a backlash when that um, policy was passed at the IEEE about considering the SSPPU licensing as one of the factors. And now they just they just withdrew that. But it did give more clarity. It did give more certainty. And you know, the sky didn't fall because that policy was in place, you know? Um, so it's just, it's just so much jockeying for position. And if we take that out of the mix, these are not issues that cannot be solved, but there has to be cooperation. And that's why now you see the regulators stepping in and trying to give their views. But the problem is you are now having people that have no real life experience in this space trying to solve these problems for you. And that's why they come to people like me and others, because we have the real life experience. And there's a huge learning curve for these people because they probably never even heard about steps five years ago. And now they're making laws that are going to affect all of us. And it's not just, you know, you talk about step licensing and you immediately think about connectivity and cellular, but any rules and regulations are going to affect step licensing across the board. And we have a lot of standards out there. It's not just about connectivity and audio and video. There's even more. Right. So um, a lot of them are royalty free. That has also worked, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's different business models. It's different expectations. And um, it there just needs to be more sensitivity to the views of, of all the, all the players here. Right. But talking about, um, policy and, and guidance, I would love to hear, because you are, have been actively contributing also to some of the, um, you know, guidance that, you know, policy and, 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 and regulators um, trying to, trying to create, but there's a lot of things have happened this year. Again, can you maybe walk us through or give, give your, you know, comments on things like the IPR, uh, IEEE IPR policy, um, like other um, ideas um, of the Department of Justice and U USPDO about, you know, um, you know, withdrawing that existing policy and now working maybe on a new one or not. So, you know, some of the guidance is was taken away, my feeling. Um, how do you see this? Well, I think that, again, people are trying to find the right answers here. The IEEE issue was very political. Like I said, there was no evidence at the end of the day. In fact, even when the IEEE asked for comments on whether they should revise the policy again, there were just a hand, you know, a very few companies that had actively been lobbying them to change it. 
that uh, chimed in and most of their, I don't know what percent, a very high percentage of the comments uh, said that no, it had worked fine. There had been no bad ramifications out of it, but they still went ahead and pulled back the SSPPU part of it. And they also commented on, on injunctions and when they should be available. So that, that was a very different thing because I don't think it was driven by really con consideration of what industry as a whole would benefit from it was it was it was, there was a lot of politics involved in that. Um, the other uh, aspects of, for example, the uh, DOJ letter being pulled back. Again, it all goes back to the politics of it too. I think right now you have, um, you know, a set of uh, people that are looking at this issue very closely. I certainly know that the PTO is very looking at it very closely. I know Kathy Vidal, I've known her for years, and she is very much wanting to do the right thing. And she is working with NIST and, uh, and DOJ and others to uh, really understand these issues better so that they come, can come out with an approach that makes sense for industry as a whole and get away from this concept of, well, these people are pro-implementer, so they say this, and these people are pro-patentee, so they say this. There needs to be a balance. And what they've asked, and she actually spoke at some conferences in the Bay Area that I was speaking at, and one of her asks was, please come and talk to us. Please share your concerns. Please give us solutions, potential solutions. So they didn't pull the policy back because they were trying to, I mean, actually they did say, well, pulling the policy back is, say, is saying something. Yes, it's saying something. It's saying that that particular letter is not the position they want to take, but they want to give it more thought. They want to be very careful about achieve, trying to achieve that balance, right? And they need to hear from industry in order to do that. So I think things work differently in the US than they do other places. So for example, in China, you're seeing uh, you know, proposed regulations come out very frequently for comment. I've worked on some of those for clients that have commented on them. And they're not, you, know, you can see why the regulations are drafted the way they are. And the problem is that when these regulations pass, they're gonna have a global impact because when we're talking about licensing, we're typically talking about global licensing. The problem is, you're treated differently if you're in litigation in Europe or the US or in China or in you know, other jurisdictions, it's gonna be different. And these regulations are gonna apply in those jurisdictions. So, um, so you're seeing the regulators now come in and say, okay, we need to think about this more carefully. For example, European Commission, they're concerned, of course, they've said this openly, they're concerned about the cost of litigation, the process involved in litigation, the, the possibility that injunctions could have very detrimental effects on, on product manufacturers. And they have to, you have to be very careful when injunctions are issues and issued. I mean, we have Huawei ZTE, but that is only tip of the iceberg, right? It doesn't really get into the nitty gritty of the licensing negotiation. It just sets out some high level points. Um, but so, so now you see, for example, like the U.S. looking at this more carefully, but still case law is what drives it in the U.S. because of the way our system is set up. We don't have the ability to just come out with a regulation and say this applies. I mean, we could, but a lot, of, a lot has to go into it to get to that point. Um, but in the U.S., it is more regulation driven, too. So you have this, this interplay of the court cases versus what the regulators think should be done. And we haven't seen anything concrete come out of the regulators yet because they're still considering it. Um, this is public knowledge. Of course, we did the expert report. Then there was a call for, for evidence or call for um, comments. And then now there is uh, kind of they're finalizing the impact assessment statement that they're going to put out. And then there's been a lot of work done on transparency, as you well know. There's been, and I think you've probably been involved in some of that, this concept of how do we really determine Who's got what? What is essential? What's not essential? There's no there's no assessment or or valuation, not valuation, but um, assessment that's done um, when a patent is declared, for example, to ST, whether it is truly essential or not, it's self declared. So those are the kind of the key points: transparency. We need better understanding of what's essential and who owns what. We need a better way of approaching FRAND determinations, particularly when it comes to rates, and we need to con control this this litigation aspect of it um, and maybe push more for ADR um, in, in a venue where people really trust the process. And so those are all things that are being looked at. 
Yeah, I mean, especially IPLX, of course, we try at least on the data side to be very much contributing to transparency. But I think for us, it's also important to keep explaining the limitations of data that is available. As you say, it's not even sometimes available. So that is, I, I think, a big challenge. And people, especially in policy, um, and, not, and I'm not talking policy, working for a regulator, being policy, working for a corporation, they try to take out things and you know put it in their own agenda and and have a story around it and i think that's not 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 very helpful um but but going back to the us because i think europe is pretty active you know the commission really pushes out you know studies they even organize conferences webinars they really want a discussion um i mean everyone hopes maybe not over regulating things but i think the the general initiative is 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 right mm -hmm. um it, it's is what is what is what can be expected from the us because there's you know, uh, I, you know, we both met Kathy at this conference, and she she was great. But can we expect something, you know, think official? There's even rumors of a court uh, where France should be determined in the U.S. Is is there? Do you have any feeling or idea that the, what, what the U.S. will do, or will they keep it rather liberal? And you know, as you said, it's more about the courts, and 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 we don't want to touch, you know, too much into that system. Yeah. So um, I think there is definitely a desire to create a better system. But there are limitations, like I said, in terms of what different branches of government can do, right? Courts, we know what they're, they're you know, uh, what they can do, basically what their directive is, and they, they're doing what they what they understand to be within their powers. Um, the, the, a lot of this has been industry driven in the US, right? So that's why it's important for the government officials to hear from industry, because they feel like, industry drive this, drives this more than anything. So coming out with a set of regulations that don't really fit with what industry is thinking or doing or needs is not gonna be very productive, right? So it has to support what industry believes is the right approach. And that's why they have asked for consultations with, these, with the companies to see what is the real issue here and how can we help resolve these issues, right? Because this flip, flip-flopping between, you know, there's a policy letter and now we pull it. And now there's a different policy letter or, you know, this SDO changes its policy, but now we're changing it back. This is not helping anyone. We need to have a path forward, right? So I think what's happening in the U.S. is that um, particularly with the even the court thing that you just mentioned, there is rumors, and I've actually seen this, this draft um, legislation that proposes setting up a royalty court, basically, a court that would make these determinations with regard to royalty rates. But it's driven by industry. Again, it's a legislation that was drafted um, by industry players, a handful of industry players, and it still doesn't have a sponsor on the Hill. So nobody has agreed to bring it before Congress. I think that, um, Perhaps with what with having a a uh, for example after these elections that we've recently had, perhaps we'll see more traction on that. Perhaps there will be a a champion for that kind of legislation um, in the House and in the Senate at some point. I know that again, it's industry that's pushing for it right now. But you look at that and you say, okay, um, there's a lot of good things in here, but it's probably not something that even industry within that segment that is looking for this kind of solution would agree to, right? That's why you only have maybe a handful of companies that are driving it. So it's a starting point, just like we had a starting point when I was working on the AI, what turned out to be the AIA, which was patent reform at the time, mm -hmm. where we started out with the starting point, that's the legislation that Innovation Alliance and my company at the time and many others had problems with. What we ended up with in the AIA was very different from where we started. A lot of the what we consider the bad things came out, but at the same time, during that multi-year process, the courts made a lot of decisions that helped one side or the other as well, right? So it all works hand in hand, and I think that there's probably going to be some traction on this royalty court um, legislation, but once it becomes public and once people start lobbying for or against it, it's going to look different. It's not going to be exactly what it is right now. So we'll have to see how that comes out. But I think it's it shows that there is this desire among industry 
to create more certainty and to be able to deal with these issues in a better way than, um, than we have so far. Great. Tony, this has been great. Thank you for all your insights. Very sure. exciting discussion. And I'll leave this one with my very last question. I have, uh -huh. you know, to, anyone has to answer. What do you want our audience to keep remembering from you? What's your final statement? Um, I mean, I'll keep it short. I keep mentioning this throughout, but the final statement is that the solution needs to come from industry. Um, regulators may participate, courts may participate, but at the end of the day, it's industry that's gonna really create a lasting solution. And in order for that to happen, they have to consider there needs to be more transparency. There needs to be more certainty about what companies ex need to expect, what companies can expect when they go into this space. And efficiency is a key factor. We can't have these multi-year litigations and negotiations going on. And it just requires a balanced point of view. So I guess that's really the thing is just, those are words we used a lot when we were doing the patent pool, uh, when I was running the patent pools, is you know transparency, efficiency, balance, those are key to the system. And we still we have a ways to go to get to that point. And it has to be not driven from regulators or courts at the top, but from industry who really understands the business. Great, thank you so much. This was Terane Megami um, in a great episode here with the IPlytics SEP Couch. Listen in to the next episode and thanks for listening in. Mm -hmm.